Good morning everyone, I'm Soph, these are my notes, and yes, this is a face reveal of my girlfriend. She's a sniffer dog, surprise! <laughs> no, obviously not, but she does have a bonkers incredible sense of smell, which is one of the many things I love about her. So I've had a bit of a cold for the last few weeks, on top of the labyrinthitis, I know, some people get all the luck, and uh, my girlfriend Celeste uh, said to me, oh yeah, like, you smell really different. Not, not worse, just a bit different. Yeah, and it turns out that I smelt bad, not only in terms of ability, but also in terms of parfum. And when she told me this, I was like, what? Smell and illness are super linked. Traced all the way back to a paper from 1976, certain diseases are listed as being linked to certain smells. And this can be smells coming from your sweat, your urine, your breath, and even your blood. Typhoid, with its high temperature, extreme tiredness, and constipation, apparently makes you smell like freshly baked bread, appropriate. Uh, and yellow fever moves away from the bakery to the butchers, making you smell like a butcher's. Those are some of the more specific examples from that paper, with other diseases having scientific odour descriptors of unpleasant, obnoxious, offensive, and of course I can't miss out the medically accurate stench. Going even further back than 1976, imagine, smell has been used as a diagnostic tool throughout history. The Latin diabetes mellitus, mellitus, I'm not sure I pronounce that, I think it's mellitus, uh, actually translates to passing through sweet, because one way of diagnosing it was by tasting sweet smelling urine. Diabetes actually even used to be called pissing evil <laughs> what? sounds like how like a british person would describe a villain oh they're pissing evil they are oh, speaking of sweet wee there are some diseases where the smell actually gives them their name so maple syrup urine disease needs no further description but it occurs when your body can't break down certain things and that causes up a buildup of substances in your blood and pee which can be really harmful but also give your urine that characteristic smell there's a similar cause for something called trimethylaminuria where the main symptom is that you smell like fish and that's because your body can't break down a smelly chemical called trimethylamine into something that smells less, which it normally would do, and that's often because of a faulty gene. These are both examples where the scientific explanation of the smell is pretty solid, but for most of the examples I've given, chemically connecting these token smells, like bread or meat, to a particular molecule proves tricky. And even though I've seen a lot of those smells cited in various places, going up to articles written quite recently, if you go back to the original source, they are actually just anecdotal. They seem to be partly because generally smell is quite an understudied area in a lot of science. Volatile compounds is the name we give to chemicals that give things their smells and there's so many of them that isolating them and naming them and you know separating them seems like quite a mammoth task and arguably one that doesn't look that valuable. Organic chemists are probably the people in the scientific community that care the most because they're always huffing and sniffing all sorts but maybe we need to get like perfumiers to do lectures, guest lectures at universities to make us all realise the value of smell science and of honing your nose, of honing, nosing, noning, there's something in there. And it's not just science that turns a blind nose to smell. We as individuals generally, not everyone's like this, but I feel like most of us don't really pay as much attention to what we smell as what we see or hear, for example. You know, we find it harder to describe smells, to pinpoint specifics about them. We don't even really have the vocabulary to describe them very well, at least in my culture, in my language. And I get it, sight and sound feel like more tangible ways of experiencing our environment, but smells are really powerful too for everything from inducing memories to attracting or repelling others. Which brings me back to my situation with my girlfriend. So I didn't have, I don't have a diagnosable disease, at least not one from that table from earlier, but I did slash do have a nasty cold. Now illnesses like colds are thought to change how your breath smells at least because infected mucus and the like collects in the back of your throat. Plus, if your nose is blocked, you're more likely to breathe out of your mouth, which then dries your mouth out, which also contributes to bad breath. A dry mouth is one of the main causes of bad breath. But as I've said, it's not just your breath that changes smell when you're ill, and having a cold is no different, actually. Your ramped up immune system when you're infected gives your sweat a characteristic scent too. Again, the direct chemical causes for this immune system scent don't seem to be well defined, but there has been research into the existence of it, of the eau d'immune, the immune 
if you will. And it looks like my girlfriend isn't the only one who can smell it. In 2014, there was a study where eight different people wore different t-shirts in two scenarios. One where they were injected with salty saline that would have no effect on them. And in the other, they were injected with lipopolysaccharide, AKA LPS. Now LPS kickstarts the human immune system or the immune system with your body reacting in similar ways to if you'd been infected by something. The t-shirts these people wore absorbed their sweat meaning they became a sniffable BO sample from each scenario. And then 40 other volunteers were recruited to sniff the different t-shirts. What a day for them. They had 18 t-shirts to sniff in total, right? Eight from the normal saline injected situation, eight from the immune system activated situation, and two controls that hadn't been worn by anyone. So all the volunteers sniffed each of these t-shirts twice in a random order. And when I read that, I just thought, surely you'd just get like nose blind, like you know when you're trying to sniff for a new perfume but anyway, apparently didn't affect them. So they sniffed them and then they rated them on various rankings between minus seven to seven and minus four to four. Who knows why those are the numbers they chose, but anyway. The results were that the immune activated t-shirts were ranked as more intense, less pleasant and less healthy than the others. And of course, right, the people didn't know what they were sniffing. So they ranked these without knowing which were the immune t-shirts and which weren't. Now it's worth noting that these t-shirts were worn just a few hours after these people's immune systems had been activated. So it's most likely well before the person wearing them even knew their immune system was activated. They probably weren't presenting any external symptoms of that activation, but the difference could still be smelled. So there's some evidence beyond my anecdote about Celeste to suggest that we can smell when people are ill whether we know that that's what we're smelling or not. And the theory is that we've evolved this simply to keep away from things that are bad for us, including ill people. It's even been shown that smelling nasty smells like rotten yeast will actually boost your immune system to kind of supposedly prep you for coming into contact with something a bit nasty. Makes sense. But beyond their evolutionary benefits, disease-linked odors these days have another advantage. Even if we don't know the specific chemical causes of these smells, there are still many ways that we're putting the nose in diagnosis and using them to spot diseases, from detecting them in labs to detecting them with labs. Medical detection doctors have been trained to sniff out all sorts, from prostate cancer to COVID. For COVID, all they have to do is sniff a sock worn by someone who had it and they can detect it. While they're pretty accurate, no one is suggesting that dogs should be used as a diagnostic tool on their own, but rather that they could be used in combination with other things to help detect diseases, potentially before any noticeable symptoms develop. And they're great because it's non-invasive, right? You don't need to inject someone with a dog in order to get the dog to smell them. Beyond diagnosis, assistance dogs can be employed to help people living with a range of diseases, from POTS, postural tachycardia syndrome, to pissing evil, sorry, I mean, diabetes. Dogs can be trained to warn their owners of various things, from impending fainting episodes to low blood sugar. But it's not just dogs and my girlfriend that can sniff out illness. Joy Milne is a Scottish woman who can smell when people have Parkinson's. Six years before her husband got diagnosed, she noticed that his scent had changed. It had become more woody, more musky. It was only when she was in a room with others who'd also been diagnosed with Parkinson's after her husband had, that she realized it was common amongst all of them. And she told some researchers about this and they kind of wondered if she was just well-meaning but had actually just kind of noticed the smell of old people. So they put her to the test. They gave her some t-shirts from a mix of people who had Parkinson's and people who didn't. She correctly identified all of those with Parkinson's, but did incorrectly select one who didn't. At least the researchers thought she was incorrect, until eight months later, the person who'd worn that t-shirt was then diagnosed with Parkinson's. She'd sniffed it out before their diagnosis. I just think that's one of the most incredible things I've ever read. Of course, it's difficult to roll out diagnostic dogs and incredible Scottish women on larger scales, which is why some researchers are looking into developing electronic noses or e-noses that can detect telltale molecules reliably and accurately. But as I've already said, recognizing there's a change and knowing what's causing that change and why are two very different things. And for e-noses to work, we need to understand chemically what's happening with a change of smell. One example where we already know which 
molecule varies is in asthmatic people. They breathe out more nitric oxide or NO from their noses and mouths when their airways are inflamed. So if we have a way to detect this, even with like a handheld device, it could be used to help diagnose asthma or even predict oncoming attacks. Of course, we do need to pinch our salt and hold our horses. See, I've got a new prop now before getting too excited because there could be other reasons why a group of people share the same smell. Like there was one example where some researcher got really excited because it seemed like everyone in a hospital was breathing out the same molecule, but it turned out that that was just a volatile compound that was from the cleaning fluid that they used in the hospital. So not as exciting as they hoped. Nevertheless, the more research we put into detecting and researching and isolating volatile, aka smell compounds, then the more likely we'll be able to detect some of these diseases early. And this is a game changer for any disorder, but especially those like cancer and neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's, where time is of the essence and early detection gives us more opportunities for treatment. That's it for now though everyone, please do like this video if you like it, share it if you share it, subscribe if you subscribe it, media my socials if you want to do that, and comment with your smell ability. Can you sniff when someone's ill? What is your relationship to smell? Let me know. I don't end up replying to all comments because I get a bit overwhelmed, but I do read them all and I really appreciate them all, so thank you for your comments. Otherwise, all I have to say is thank you so much for watching, have a lovely day, and remember, the only nose job you need is to give your nose the job of smelling things. So my tip today is to hone your nose give it a try. A big welcome to my Patreon page to Bruce Patterson and Poos Lias. I hope you'll feel very welcome here. And a hello again to Angela Drove and Terry. Thanks so much to all my patrons, you're the best. Face reveal in three, two, one. Hey, hey there. Sweet cheeks. You smell like fish. Judy Stench. Obviously not, but maybe we need to get perfumiers in. Yes, I have been learning French. That's why I was like, perfumiers. This is wonky. No, it's wonky. Of course, we need to uh, pinch our salt. It's closed. I can't pinch it while it's closed. I can try. Celeste, will you do me the honor of being in my thumbnail for clickbait purposes. <laughs> <laughs> she said yes, she said yes. You made it to the end, but it doesn't have to end here. Here's a video I've chosen for you. Here's a playlist of some of my favorites. And here's a cheeky little Patreon link if you want to support me and get some extra content for your eyes and ears and nose, maybe, if you try. Bye.